Hey, hustlers. This is part two of episode 43, How to Land a High-Paying Job in Tech with Ayo Dile. If you haven't already listened to that episode, part one, go back and listen to that and come right back. If you are already here from part one, then enjoy the episode. Peace. Do, 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 like, so what do you do? This is a quick side, but we'll get back to this in a second. No, 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 I'm trying to think. Like, how that's for jokes, you know? <laughs> that's, how you know, that's, how you, that's how you know it's been a while. I've seen the play. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. how you know it's been a while, of course. You can't even, can't even remember how they approach you. But usually, but see, I'm tall too, so it's different, man. So they, it's not even, I don't even know if they make the play based off of like what they know that I do. So usually the segue is just me being tall, standing out like, yo, like, who are you? It's usually, a, usually make some sort of assumption that I'm somebody and I'm not really somebody. And then we make small talk and we talk probably like two, three, you know, questions later, they'll be like, okay, what do you do? And I'll say like, hey, I work for Facebook, I work for Microsoft. And then the eyes get wide and it's like, oh, you do this? Like, what are you like? What are you really? Like? <laughs> what is your day to day like? You know, so I'll talk to them about that. So usually I would say they usually make the combo based off of just like my parents. And they'll mm-hmm. usually just be like, hey, like, you know, there'll be something like I look like. I usually, I don't know why, but they usually come to me saying I look like Tupac. I don't think I do. But Tupac? Like, look, I don't know how. I, don't. I think I think if you shave your head, bro, you shave your beard, you leave the, <laughs> leave the stash, I can see it. I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I get it, man. I don't. I just, to this day, I don't. I don't know why I get nah, it. No, if you should be, I think you could, we could get get off like a Freddie Gibbs. Freddie Gibbs, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Huh? You, you know what I'm saying? Freddie? I never if, got if that you, one before. If you go like completely bald, you know what I'm saying? You get a gangster Gibbs, Gibbs off. Oh man, that's hilarious, man. I fuck with Gibbs though. That's my guy. Oh yeah, so, for sure. I take last project way. that he just dropped. Hard, hard. <sighs> Goes hard, bro. Fire. It's the Gibbs. Fire. Yeah, I, I rock with Gibbs heavy, man, super mm-hmm. heavy. So, yeah, but nah, um, that's usually how it goes, man. But I would say, like, specifically out here in the Bay Area, women are very friendly. You know, they, they'll come right up to you. Women will talk to you before you talk to them. I know in a lot of other states in the country, um, you know, it's vice versa. The dude, mm-hmm. you know, that's the way it is, right? Mm-hmm. The dude initiates the conversation out here. It's, it's the opposite. If they see you, any kind of attraction or something that, you know, catches their eye, they'll talk to you and then, you get to they tell them what you do, and then, you know, after that, you take it from there. Yeah, form follows function, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> thing is, when you, it's interesting you brought up Black women in tech and how they're so, you know, widely represented. Uh, Alex and I actually we had this conversation before mm-hmm. that you see all these groups, uh, Black Girls Code, yep. uh, Black Girls, Girl Boss This, Black Girl Boss all these different variations of different names that mm-hmm. promote black empowerment, especially black women, which is great, which is amazing because, you know, being a black woman, it's extremely tough. You know, not only are you facing racial discrimination, you're also facing like gender discrimination, right? It's yeah. like a double whammy that you're facing. And, um, you know, we actually, we actually asked each other this, why isn't there like a, a male version of that, especially for, like the tech space, right? There is, there isn't really, uh, it's, we, we're talking here in Toronto, maybe in the States you might see it different, but yeah. we don't really notice like our community, especially the men, like bonding together like that to really empower and prop each other up. I guess because with men, and I, I don't, I, even me, I don't know if it's off my head, like a black men in tech, they had they had like a internal group for that at Facebook because I mean, I, I'm pretty sure if I, if I, the numbers are correct, I've, pretty sure there was more black women in, in Facebook than men, um, mm-hmm. if I had to guess. Uh, but don't quote me on that. But in general, outside of Facebook, I don't know. But I, if I had to assume, I think it's just because, like, we are kind of the, I guess, the, I won't say the majority, but we kind of, you know, men, we already have that privilege at the end of the day, right? So mm-hmm. it's like, why make ourselves more exclusive in kind of that, that all boys club when, at the, when we should be supporting these women? Um, That's true. We, we should be, you know, black girls code advocates um instead of Mm. making our own boys club on the side as well too you know yeah so that's my thought process that's a big that's a fact man that's a fact um talking about like you know you being an engineer and um you being in the black space what are some things like black engineers and developers can do to really get into these spaces if they don't really know anybody to really come and get that job, get that interview, to get into yeah. Facebook or Microsoft. Yeah, man, there's a ton of different things, man. Um, one, one, you, you got to network 
And, and I think, I mean, we all li linked up at Afrotech, man. So look at, mm -hmm. look at us now, you know, uh, but you really got to like go out your way to network. And I think, you know, I'm not trying to preach the choir because everybody knows you should be networking, but you need to network with people who have already done it. So a yeah. lot of people will network with people, not necessarily saying this is a bad thing, but at the same time, you're all both aspiring engineers or you're both aspiring to get to Google, right? But it's like, none of y'all are there. So y'all don't really know the breakdown of steps and Google's gonna tell you, they'll, you know, they're pretty transparent with, all right, you gotta study this as a third, but you don't know until you get in. Like I've interviewed with Google before and obviously I did not get Google. <laughs> so it's like, you know, so, so it's like, you know, you know, it's like you need to, you know, and I was making this mistake too. And I'll, you know, I'll tell you guys a little story, man. Um, this was, this was probably the Afrotech we've met and I was taking so many L's, man. So this is Afrotech two years ago and I was taking L after L after L, man. It was IBM, nope. Um, Google, nope. Microsoft at that time didn't even, they turned me down, you know? So it was like L after Amazon turned me down and what I was doing um, that I realized was I wasn't collaborating with people who had already done it. I was collaborating with people who was like, yo, like I would just be like, tell my boy, like, yo, hit me with this coding question and, you know, just, you know, just, just prep with me for a second. But I really wasn't, you know, reaching out to somebody who at, was at Facebook in the role that I was trying to get at and hitting them up on LinkedIn and saying like, yo, can you mind just quizzing me for like 30 minutes? And you'd be surprised, especially somebody who looks like you, they are more than inclined to help out. And it, it took me seeing like, I was like, cause they have this, at least in my mind, they have this thing where in, you know, these tech companies, if you keep trying, you know, eventually it's kind of going on your, your permanent record, right? Where it's like, all right, this person tried to get this role. He didn't get this role, give him another year and he can try again. But after a while, like if you, the more apps you put in, it kind of like decreases your chance, right? So I can't keep applying to every single thing I got. I missed one thing. I can't apply to another thing. So I was kind of like essentially on my last strike. Cause I knew I was like, I need to get into big tech. And, you know, I have Facebook. Shout out to my homegirl who got me the, uh, who got me the interview. And she was just like, you know, maybe, you know, if I connect you with somebody here, you know, in this space and, you know, you can prep for your interview. So I reached out to him. He was super receptive. And he kind of was, I'm thinking it was going to be a light interview when you, and this is why I say it's important to network with people who are already in it because the level of, the level of uh, prep that he gave me was on another level from what my friend's were giving me right I was it was so intense it was like okay you got this tell me why you made that decision tell me why it was always a why 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 it was like four whys after I gave the right answer he's like I'm not you're not wrong it's just like I just want to know like you got to break this thing down to me so I didn't have it at that level uh where I where you know where these people can get, easily get tripped up at where I would get tripped up previously at so you know it was just like connecting with people who are in the space as well too i think that's that's the key you got to connect with people who are in that space man so going to these these conferences and leveraging your really linkedin man, those are the big things for sure absolutely big yeah. gem yeah big gem that's a big gem man yeah. absolutely so so now like when you get in the place now you've got in the door right mm -hmm. you've gone through the the grind of the interview you've got your contacts Talk to us about the life of being a black engineer, like a black yeah. developer. How's that like when, especially it's like, uh, let's say 90% white, you're one of the only black engineers. What are some things that you notice being in tech that people should be aware of when they mm -hmm. get into, like some mistakes that you've made that you should not make when you're in the environment and some things you should do more just to, you know, make yourself comfortable. Talk yeah. about that experience like. Well, now the last two roles, I've kind of not, I guess my experience is kind of graduating me there. Now I manage the engineer. So now I'm kind of like leading, I kind of run the, the team essentially. So now I'm less hands on with my code or I'll, I'll look over code and I'll run queries and data on stuff, what they're doing. For the most part, I'm kind of leading them. But I would say in general, um, you know, the things that you want to do, I think you kind of just want to, you know, and this is in general, you want to, you know, you want to make that statement. Like you want to show your worth, show your value early. Don't come up there um, and think that, especially a lot of these tech companies, you have this boot camp time and you have this time to kind of, you usually get like three months of like, all right, like you can kind of like, you know, diddle daddle, do whatever you want to do, kind of just take your time mm -hmm. and learn. But I would say if you can, man, obviously don't rush it too much, but cut, cut that three months down to two months or a month mm -hmm. and a half where it's like, okay, I'm, showing that like out of my boot camp class, I'm really the one who's kind of like yeah. really 
accelerating right now because I think it's the same thing with you, you, we know the game man you got to work mm-hmm. twice as hard as your counterparts right so show exactly. that impact early because when you do do that people are going to be like okay by month three when your your peers are getting onboarded and they're like just getting assignments people are going to assign you as this go-to person for this or mm-hmm. you know and having that rapport when people can trust you is the mm-hmm. biggest thing in any in any any company it doesn't matter tech mm-hmm. or not if I can trust you y'all trust each other which is why you guys do this whether you, you mm-hmm. trusted that you guys are going to get here at five o'clock and you guys somebody's going to record it and we're going to use zoom all this stuff all that stuff goes into trust yeah. you know so that's the big thing like if you establish your impact early people will trust you and then you kind of you kind of make your name for yourself at that so that that'd be my thing like go harder go harder don't use that three months period where they give you to learn and feel things out chop that in half get to it earlier the earlier the better man facts bro yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, did you do the uh, like exercise where you like, reach out to other teams and introduce yourself and just try to get acquainted early? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would definitely do that, man. And that was that was what I was doing, man. I was every, especially when I started at Facebook, man. Because if you guys have ever came up to Silicon Valley, man, they have a crazy campus and it's huge, man. And it's like a damn college, man. So, and it was I was networking and. Like, hey, I want to reach out to you and I want to set up some time on your calendar. And these people are all over campus, man. I didn't realize, I'm thinking, I'm setting up back-to-back meetings. Meanwhile, these, you know, these meetings is like 15 minutes away, 30 minutes away on campus. And I'm like, man, but I wanted to go out my way to kind of just network with people because at the end of the day, my, my mentality is always like, I'm here for a good time, not a long time. You know, I'm not here to help build Facebook up or Microsoft up just straight up to be whatever it's trying to get to. I'm here to absorb this knowledge, make these networks and take this back to what I'm trying to build and build my own empire at the same time too. Mm-hmm. So at the same time, at the same time where, you know, a lot of people who get there are playing this game with like, yeah, I want to be the CEO or I want to be the director of X, Y, and Z. That's great. You're going to make a lot of money doing that. But I'm trying to build my own thing. So I need to get to, you know, plant my feet on the ground, absorbing this knowledge, building these contacts because these people could be potential people that are going to be allies to me in the future. Because at Facebook, I, Got people I still communicate with to this day, you know. Lockheed, mm-hmm. same thing. TD Bank, ironically, I still communicate with people at TD Bank. And I was, goddamn, I was probably like pushing ten years ago now. So, um, you know, yeah, man. So I think that that's kind of the, the way I look at it. So shifting gears into entrepreneurship, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Tech entrepreneurship. Uh, there's again a lack of black founders yes. in in the space. Yes. Um, there's aspiring black founders who want to build a company in tech, but, you know, they face uh, barriers to really get into the market. Talking about funding, uh, the reason like why there's not a lot of uh, startups and a lot of black startups is lack of access to funding and as well, lack of access to get into those doors to like a VC or a angel investor because you just don't really know each other. So they never really get the light of day mm-hmm. uh, from your experience, you know, you are, uh, you know, you, you're an engineer, you're a developer, you're also building your own company on the side. How has your experience been with talking to venture capitalists? Uh, what are they looking for when you're a black mm-hmm. founder and how do you connect with them do you, uh, when you want to get an intro or a presentation with them? Yeah. And it, you know, what's so funny is, um, so I won't say I won't sit up here and say like I've talked to so many venture capitalists, even though I'm mm-hmm. in the Bay. But there was one venture capitalist who I'm still connected with to this day, man. Again, another ally. Um, and I won't say his name, but he's invested in this company that's gonna go crazy, man. Like this um guys look it up. It's called Status um Status Pro. They're combining VR with sports. So just think about Lamar Jackson as their signature athlete. So you're gonna be able to play football and feel like you're in Lamar Jackson's shoes or whatever. So I was connected with him. And I was telling them about, like, I wasn't pitching them on my idea, but I was like, yeah, like, I'm kind of coming, too. Like, I don't think I'm just here just doing this. Chilling. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm coming. Like, so, like, I know that you're an angel investor. Like, I want you to, you know, you, you see my work ethic. I want you to support. And then he was just kind of hitting me to, like, yeah, like, okay, like, make sure you have X, Y, and Z, X, Y, and Z, X, Y, and Z. So I'll say this from the, we're going to talk about both sides. But I think, you know, because you alluded to this earlier, there's like a, a bit of a, a thing where it's like people feel as though they can't get any funding. However, a lot of people, and again, this just comes down to access and resources, especially when it comes to tech entrepreneurship, you have to play a different game. 
you can't come with an idea and just be an idea. You can't be like, yo, I have this idea that's going to allow us to, tra- we're going to be able to transport each other over here. This is a great idea. I got it mapped out. It's all written down. They're going to be like, yo, show me. And they're not going to just be like, show me. They're going to be like, show me how many users you got on it so far. What's the engagement like? How much is it going to cost to make this? What's the, they're going to ask you so many things that they're expecting you to have just for them to even take a meeting with you, let alone invest in you. So these are just some things that people have to be in mind of, right? So when you think about these things, you have to build an MVP, a minimal viable product for them to even show up and invest in you. So I think a lot of times people get discouraged because they're thinking like, okay, I have this great idea and I reached out to the venture capitalist and he shut me down. But it's like, yeah, you really don't, you have an idea, but they're looking for a product. So that's, a, that's, you know, on that side, people need to understand, like you need to, for them to, people aren't investing in what you're going to do. They're investing in what you have done and what you need them to do. So when people invest in you, they say, boom, I need this $50 million because I need to maximize my marketing resources. I need to maximize my human resources for me to build out more code. I need to maximize I need a place for us to actually work. So I need like, the, the, these are things that that's where that money goes, right? It doesn't go straight into the pockets and you say, all right, I got $50 million. So, you know, you have to have like a plan of like, okay, I've done this small thing. I've proved out my concept. Now we can move forward and I need this much more money for me to maximize the concept. And that's when they'll go in. So that's, that's just one thing that people just need to remember. However, on the side of, why they aren't um, investing. I think it's a fact of a lot of different things. Visibility, Mm -hmm. the visibility, the access to the face-to-face access to these venture capitalists is just not there for whatever reason. And it could be the fact that a lot of these venture capitalists are based in Silicon Valley, like I said before. And a lot of, you know, I I stand on this. Anybody can come on here and say like, nah, you tripping. No, there's just not a lot of black people who, want to come to Silicon Valley. Um, they do it, you know, just like Squire. They did it and, you know, look at them now. Um, I'm, I'm pretty confident they came out to Silicon Valley. They were in a Y Combinator. Um, yeah, so they, they came were. out here. So they came out here for at some point, um, you know, so, you know, you got to come out here and get that FaceTime with them as well, too. And at the same time, um, I think another thing is just the fact that people, there is just kind of this lack of, I won't say it's not, it's kind of an extension of the FaceTime, but it's just the kind of the fact that there isn't um, that direct line of connection as well, too. So just the, the, you know, people aren't connected to, you know, founders just off of, you know, just so, so, you know, see here, here say, see, say. So if I create a great product, it could be great, but, you know, a venture capitalist may not catch wind of it. You know what I'm saying? So Mm -hmm. it's just that line of connection that we don't have access to. So it's, it's a problem with just that, because we need this access and we need them to receive us at the same time as well too. So I think it's just kind of a communication, that FaceTime thing. Um, but at the same time, they have to go out their way to look too, because it's, you know, if they're not going out their way to look, it's the same thing we were talking about with, you know, these big companies. You want your, because at the end of the day, this is their investment. You want your investment to boom. You want to, you want to turn 50 million into a billion. So yeah. how are you going to do that by having a big diverse audience? So and you to have a big diverse audience, you have to have a diverse pool of you know people that you're pouring your money into. These people are pouring their money into just one one startup. They got their money spread out all over the place just to make sure their return on investment is secure. Like they'd be a fool to just put their all their, their money into one you know one in one horse uh, essentially. You know? mm-hmm. So yeah, it, you know, spreading it around like they they want to hit that one unicorn. You know, like oh, for. Yeah. I think I was looking at Sequoia Capital's numbers. I think for every 15 to 20 startups, they'll probably get like one unicorn company that mm-hmm. just blows it out of the water that yeah. like ends up becoming like a actual mass market success. And you're and that's talking all that about matters. that's uh, all that matters, all, right? To them, if, if you hit, if everything else broke even or maybe rose up a little bit, you know, on the return mm-hmm. on investment, that's solid. And then you got that one that hit a, you know, went crazy and you're a winner at the end of the day, man. So yeah. from an investment standpoint. Even, um, I was going to say as well, Tristan Walker, they were in Oakland. I mean, San Fran, then they moved to Atlanta. So now they're like an Atlanta based company because yep. he also echoed the same thing. He's just like, you know, why am I going to build a company that is meant for people who look like me and my employees, but the place we're building, it doesn't really, really reflect that. Why not exactly. go to Atlanta 
and actually be in a place where it's actually we're represented. We can actually have a direct access to our customer yeah. and we can recruit more talented people who exactly. look like us instead of, you know, making them come all the way to Silicon Valley, man. And so. I th- it's good that you mentioned, I'm, I'm going to take you off, but Atlanta is really booming in terms of tech. Mm-hmm. Man. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously moving down there um, a month, a month of some change. So I'll be <laughs> moving down there. Um, yeah. yeah, man. Microsoft is establishing a football print down there because they know all the talent is down there. They're trying to get more diverse. So they got like at least like a uh, thousand five hundred folks coming into Atlanta now, um, but not even from just like a big company standpoint. There's so much entrepreneurship and tech going on there that's booming and it's just bubbling up right now. And people are understanding the value of us, and it's because of us. So it's like we're going down there, building it up, making money off of it. We're building these companies in Atlanta, and now, like I showed you over the other day, mm-hmm. Google for startups is ran by a woman who lives in Atlanta and she's, um, I think her name is Jewel Solomon. I think Burks, Jewel Solomon Burks. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah. But yeah. So she's, she, she's based in Atlanta and she's essentially a big advocate for, you know, startups. And now Google's pouring their money into these startups now because of that push based in Atlanta, black woman. She also owns her own um, funding company that funds, that's going to fund 50 million into black startups as well too, based in Atlanta as well. So it's like mm-hmm. these things are trending um, for, you know, in Atlanta, but I'm sure it's going to be reflected in the whole, you know, the country and hopefully the world soon. But everything's booming down there, man. You got to start somewhere. And I'm glad it's mm-hmm. in a black city like Atlanta for sure. Most definitely. Atlanta's beautiful, man. And it's great for real estate as well. Oh, yeah. You can go down there. You don't need much to, to live really good down there, man. It's very cheap. So it's getting more expensive. And I'm sure it's if it keeps booming like this, it's going to go up. But you know, it's, you got to take the you got to take the the good with the bad. You know, if you got yeah. if you get if you get in soon enough, your property is going to appreciate. <laughs> That's a fact. Yeah. Uh, speaking of um, starting up in Atlanta, um, would you suggest an uh, entrepreneur that you know that has an app idea to get a technical CEO or CTO, or try and learn the tech himself and try to build it his, his on his own? So that's a really good question. And the answer to that is it depends on how fast you are trying to move. If you, and it depends on what your product is doing. If your product is not, is not really, you know, reinventing the wheel, but it's just like you figured out. um, So there was a girl who created um, essentially Lyft, but for women. And she's based in Atlanta as well too. Black woman and is not reinventing the wheel, Lyft, Uber, you know, all these different apps have done this, but she created it for women. And now it's probably going to bubble up a little bit. So my point is, is the fact that if I had that idea, whereas like I'm doing something just for a different market, then I'm probably going to try to learn and get the skills because at the end of the day, this information is out there. All of the, you can Google this. It's, good, it's not easy, but it, if you put in the work and you isolate yourself and you ask questions and you focus and spend, don't spend your time all scrolling on Instagram, but focus on learning the product, then yes, I would say go forward with it because it's not a super extraneous thing. However, if it's something that is very technical and is way outside your swim lane, not, nobody's ever done it before, but you have this great idea and but you have a hunch that somebody can do it and you have somebody who can do it, then I definitely think you should go the CTO route. I will say about the CTO is just the fact that the CTO is somebody that when you're trying to get these VCs to pour in money to you, that person needs to be something when that code breaks and when it will break because you hope it breaks because more users are on the system and it crashes, right? So it's a good problem to have, right? So when that code breaks, the CTO is a person that needs to be knowledgeable of how to debug that code and fix it ASAP. Because you need, if you're getting that influx of users like, yeah, we just got this crazy spike, we just went viral, 50,000, 500,000 users just hopped on and downloaded our platform and they're using it, but we broke. That CTO needs to know, okay, I know I have a hunch of what, what I need to fix, I can fix it, we'll back up. You know, so you can't just be a, a sometimes the like, oh, I, you know, I, I get my hands dirty when I get my hands dirty kind of CTO. It's not gonna work like that. Your job as a CTO is to manage or be able to fix the technical issues that um, occur. They will occur as a startup for sure. Uh, yeah, man. It's even like when I was starting back in the day, um, I just learned the fundamentals of like, HTML, CSS, yeah. and a little bit of Java too. But mm-hmm. I didn't want to be a coder or anything. It was just, just to be able to communicate 
like, yeah. hey, this, this, and also like read it in a simple way and just understand yeah. how things go. Yeah. I think that's how most people, if you're not really technical, you can invest, you know, half hour a day, just learning different yeah. uh, ways how to get started. And that's, you know, I mean, it builds up. That's all you need, man. Like, it's, I mean, even if you don't want to be a CTO or you can be a CTO, CEO, but you still, I won't say you still need to be technical, but you still probably want to know what your CTO got going on. When you look over your shoulder, you need to be able to trust like he's made every decision, he or she, excuse me, has made every decision right, right? And again, you don't, for CEO, you definitely don't need to be technical. You can have the idea, but you just need to be able to, because the CEO's job is definitely to be able to make sure the money is coming in. You, Mm -hmm. your job is to make sure that all the resources are properly um, coming in to make sure that the business is afloat. That's your number one job. Um, but at the same time, just to put you at ease, it, it goes back to that trust thing, right? Like if I can trust you um, that you're getting your shit done, you know, it kind of puts me at ease as a CTO, uh, CEO. So you should probably be able to speak the language a little bit, I would assume, you know. Well, that's definitely. Um, how would you like, learn how to code? Like, do you, do you use there specific programs out there? Like, do, did you teach yourself? No, I, I, so I went to school for it. So I was undergrad and I, and I, even me, like I'll admit, I'm not the, str- I'm not the strongest coder. Like mm-hmm. I had to, you know, when I was, I think I, like I said, I had that team that was with me. So it'd be like, damn, how do I, how do I do this? How do you do that? Like I look over their shoulder got you, got and, you, got and they got would kind of give me the hits. And after a while, like you see something or you see different ways to do something, you figure it out. Um, I think really, I really got better at coding when I, when I, you know, got into the real world. Cause it's like, oh, you have this assignment. It needs to be done or else, you know, you look like you look dumb because it's like mm-hmm. the code is on your plate, you know? So, and I, you know, then it was like, I would work with people who knew it and they would kind of give me, teach me, but also Google, man. Google is your friend when it comes to coding, man. So YouTube, there's this thing called Stack Overflow. Um, you know, there's so many different um, resources now. Um, where you can just, you know, you can learn and get the information, man. But it's it's a lot of Googling, man, because as you're coding, things are breaking. It's like, yo, why is this breaking? You got to Google the reason why it's breaking. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you fix it, then something else broke. Why that break? You know, it's just like a lot, a lot of different things breaking, man. But, you know, you know, I practice, even though I'm like right now, like I'm, I oversee the engineers. And um, so I do less coding, more data analysis. But I still just practice, man. It's still just like keep my hands, you know, hands dirty and just go on there write a little code or something like that so yeah one thing i wanted to ask you is you know being in silicon valley and you know just the state of everything right now like the climate of the world has just been focused on george floyd um even post george floyd there's you know the blm movement is now really really pushing corporations to make a change yeah a lot of companies are coming out with statements they're saying, hey, you know, we stand in solidarity with uh, companies that are doing, I mean, we stand in solidarity with our Black employees, our Black community, and we want to fight for justice. And, um, you know, it's easy to come out with a statement and really say, hey, like, this is what's going on. Uh, You being on that side of things where a lot of things are going on, uh, what's your opinion on these statements and actually, and you being on the inside and actually reflecting it, do you, what do you see? Like, are they congruent? Because there's a lot of talk right now, people saying what you're saying, what you're putting out and what you're actually doing. They're not really yeah. aligning. What's your take think, on that? I think the rubber is meeting the road. Like it's, it, I wouldn't say that there's, there are empty statements because, you know, Google, like I said, Google just, mm-hmm. just put their money where their mouth is. And I, as, as a, as a business, that is that is the most important thing because as a, as a business is an entity, so you know an entity is ran you know it stays afloat due to money. So if they put the money into something, then that has to go you know that has to go some ways. And a lot of companies, not all, but a lot of big companies are putting their money into you know black you know founders and black invest black investments, black um, you know civic engagement, so on and so forth. So they're trying to put their money into it. Um, I think it just, you know, I think it comes down to the way that you're treating people as a company in, in the, in, in the house. Right. You know, mm-hmm. like, you know, everything always starts in the house. So like we were talking about before, it's like, what are you going to do to get these, you know, the, the numbers changed in your company? Yeah. You're throwing this money to us, but what are you going to do to numbers to get these, get these numbers changed to your company? 
or yeah, you're putting out these statements, which I don't think do much. I don't think statements are anything. I think you just do it out because you've seen all your other competitors do it and mm-hmm. you know that you can't be the last one to do it. Um, you put out these statements and, you know, you need to put your, you know, you need to put action forward. Like, what are you guys going to do as a company? So um, I think companies are going to be forced. There's so much change happening as America and as a whole, you, they will be forced. It's, it's like, this is like, everything's changing right now with 2020. It's like the, the perfect storm. You got a recession that we're officially in as a country we're in a, you know, a pandemic with, you know, COVID and then this mm-hmm. race war, um, you know, everything is forced to change because of all these things mm-hmm. happening at the same time. Like every, you know, everything is going to change, man. Like the world is not going to be same after 2020. So these same institutions, these tech companies and, you know, everything has to change. It's not just people, but the companies, institutions, church, everything will change. So I think, you know, we'll see, it remains to be seen if it's going to be for better or for worse, but I'm sure there's going to be a lot of radical changes for, you know, tech institutions for sure. As you work towards wrapping up, man, uh, do you see the spread of tech democratizing more as we um, spread the internet more to more people who don't have it and more businesses popping up? Or do you see, I guess, the culture staying where it is? Like, where do you see the growth happening? This is a tough one. Because if you would have asked me this probably like before COVID or before all this this whole thing happened, I would have said that it's going to be a lot of these tech companies that it's going to be the same big six or seven companies or maybe five that just buy all the small companies, right? Like the companies, that's what they do. Like they buy, they see that you're, all right, like this company is getting a little too much steam. They're, they could potentially break our armor. Let's buy them. And these companies at the same time, that's what they want. Like a lot of these people build this stuff because they want to live good. So it's like, I just bought a, I made a company. I had it, held it for five years. I sold it, you know, for, you know, a hundred million, whatever. I'm good for life, you know? So, you know, people will do that. Um, but at the same time now, I think, you know, I, I think the government is thinking about stepping in and stepping in and saying like, hey, you guys can't monopolize technology the same way that, you know, other industries like, you know, the movie industry and the, you know, the media industry has been monopolized. Now we got Viacom and Disney and all the and Turner pretty much, they pretty much run that industry, right? There's only like five big players in that. And tech has kind of become the same way where it's like Apple, Google, uh, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, you know, so on and so forth. Where they just buy the startups, just like how Microsoft bought Skype. And I'm sure somebody's going to buy Slack. I, I also give bought, they also bought LinkedIn too. Microsoft. Oh yeah, yeah, yep. They bought LinkedIn. Um, you know, <laughs> that won't be the last thing they buy until the government steps in. So, but at the same time, man, I think, I think this is why the change is might potentially happen. Where it's like the world is just people are like not even just revolting against you know systemic um, oppression and racism, but people are revolting, revolting against the system in terms of the capitalistic system. So it's not like people are upset with like people who are billionaires now, you know, it's, 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 it's not a big thing yet, but it's, it's, it's bubbling where people are like, why does this person have a billion, billion dollars, but we're in a recession, you know? And that's it, a crazy thought to think about, like, how you got a billion dollars, but the rest of the country's in a recession. How are you making more money in a pandemic before, prior to the pandemic? Like you're making more money now than a pandemic while we're struggling. So it's like, it's crazy to think about that. So I think people are definitely trying to see some systemic changes overall, man. And and I think the future of work is changing overall too, man. People are going to be so much more dispersed. People don't have to make that trip up to, you know, Silicon Valley to sell their product or whatever. You could just make your product in your domain and your state or your county or your city and make this product work for you and make it work for the people that are within your direct zone or your, your area. And you can be happy with that because everybody is so dispersed. We all have access to a certain level of resources that we need to be able to pr- uh, produce a product. So I think the future of work is definitely going to change and kind of balance it out just be, and along with the fact that I think tech is going to be regulated where these companies are just not going to be able to buy up every new company. So, uh, you know, I think that's kind of going to go. Yeah. I think like right now, like there's no excuse at all to make uh, something on the internet just because, uh, before, as you said, you had to go to Silicon Valley, you got to pitch. But now even here in Toronto, 
we can pitch people in Silicon Valley, like through our computer and we can make our, exactly. we can, we can hire someone, we can build a team virtually. And also, you know, I'm a believer. I like having a camaraderie in person. Mm -hmm. I don't really like kind of working at home just because I like keeping that separate, but having a little switch a little bit yeah. would work for me, but yeah, man, there's no excuse. And I, I think that's what even in, during COVID right now, man, I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. I'm loving it just because mm -hmm. we can reach to people like you and actually have this podcast before our mentality was like lo thinking locally, right? Mm -hmm. We're like, Oh, let's meet up in, in the room, bring our equipment and record. But now, this has actually opened a lot of doors for us and That's true. expanded our thinking and what we can do and the stuff we can create. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, um, yeah man, That's it's, true. it's a blessing in disguise in many ways. Now, when you think about it like that, it's like, I feel like, you know, I feel like my network has kind of increased a bit during COVID. Mm -hmm. I'm a big network guy, if you can't, so I keep mentioning it because I feel like there's a power in having a network, man, because the more people connect with people, I don't have this skill set, but this person does, and I know yeah. him, and I have a personal relationship with him, and I can bring him on. So I feel like my network has increased during COVID because we've now been forced to think outside the box, not even think outside the box, but just use the other tools that have been given to us, like Zoom and mm -hmm. other things that we can use to connect with people, right? Like, nobody's physically seeing each other anymore, but it's like, okay, that is, doesn't still mean I can't have camaraderie, I still can't connect with people, I still can't engage with people, so it's kind of evening the playing field now because it's like, I don't have to just be engaged with people who I'm physically co-located with. I can be connected with people who are in Toronto. I can be connected mm -hmm. with people back home in Nigeria um, on a, you know, on a level, or, uh, London, so on and so forth, you know? Let's, let's dive deeper into that for a quick second. Mm -hmm. well, how do you network effectively? Like, yes. And network great. without being sleazy. Without being, what was the word? Just transactional. transactional. Yeah, that is very, so the thing I, and I think the thing is that I'll never like see me we met we had a conversation and we just kept in touch up until now right like and then I reached out I was like yo like I want to hop on this journey because I think it's dope but like your your intention should always be not to you know what can I get from this person even though this person might be crazy he's got a lot of shit going on like I need to you know but you should always just be like, yo, I just want to set up a one-on-one -on -one with you just to learn about you. Just learn, the, just to get to know the person. Um, because every day, these people might end up becoming your friends. You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, we got so many similarities. At first, I just thought of you as somebody who's like, yo, you're in a field that I would want to connect with or whatever. But this person's just a friendly person, you know? So I think what, without being intentional is like, hey, you know, say if I'm meeting somebody on LinkedIn, I'll be like, hey, yo, I really like what you got going on. Um, I'm aspiring to get to X, Y, Z point. I think you'd be a great person to network with. And I would just love to just get 30 minutes or 15 minutes of your time to just learn about your background. And, you know, cause people like to talk about themselves, man. So if you ever just get a, you know, a, a moment to be like, yo, like I want to just learn about you. I guarantee you, unless you're like at a certain level where you are super duper busy, more than, more than not, people are going to go out there and be like, yo, for sure. When you get to talk about this stuff, after that, you start to learn what your similarities are. You start to get that common ground in a sense where it's like, okay, I can kind of meet you here where like, oh, you do this, this is what I do, you know, X, Y, Z. So now you're kind of finding your way rather than people who use LinkedIn or anything or just Instagram, you'll sign a DM like, yo, never met him before. Like, yo, I'm looking to do X, Y, and Z, that and the third. Sometimes that works, but then you come off salesy or transactional, you know, and it's like, ah, like I don't feel like doing this person a favor right now. Um, you know, whereas if I met you, connected with you, and now I'm kind of in your, not maybe not a friend level, but at a, a comrade level, I'm more inclined to, you know, actually help you with something, you know what I'm saying? Because I can kind of know you, I get that comfort, comfort, and then it all goes back to trust. Like, okay, I've taught this person, seems like a trustworthy person, you know? Big Jim, that's a great point. It sounds like, like to kind of put it on a bow on it, a bow on it, it's like connecting with the person and not the person's thing. Yeah, connect with the person, not what their, their product is or what they have to offer. Connect with the yeah. person as a person, you know. Exactly. What's that for? And also to add on that, one thing I also learned is before I wanted to like make a network, but you got to be patient with it as well too. Yeah. Uh, you know, reaching out to people and say, hey, let's book a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, doing that to like 20, 30 people at once. Yeah. You're definitely going to be like stacked with so much yeah. to, like you know yeah you need you need some time for yourself but yeah. doing it in a slow way actually cultivating that true bond and then you yeah. go out to the next person 
Mm-hmm. And then that person is going to introduce you to other people. Exactly. And it's going to just compound it and you're going to have like a big relationship. It's all a chain, man. Everybody's, especially now the world is getting smaller. You know, everybody's connected to everybody, you know. And I think mm-hmm. I like what you said in terms of like, because if, you, if you're setting up one-on-ones with, you know, 30 people, then that's really like more like an interview. Like, mm-hmm. it's just like, that's more transactional if you ask me, um, unless you just really have that kind of personality where you can, because after a while, I feel like if you're on one-on-ones all week and I'd probably be drained, like, all right, I'm about to say. Uh, you know, I do this and I don't do that. What you do? It's not really, you know, it's not really um, personable, uh, personable for, for me. So I think you have to do it like you do a, a job uh, hunt. Um, do it with intention, not just like, oh, I'll take this job. Like, I'll take this, this, this like, oh, I want to connect with these five people because these are people that I see at least on paper, look like somebody that'll be dope to connect with. And then leave right there. These are my five people I want to connect with, or three people. You know, I would even say five, maybe even three um, to connect with because, you know, these are the that shiny, you know, object. They got everything that I want to get to or they're at a place where it's, I feel like, yo, that I would love to just pick their brain, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Tristan Walker, if you're listening, you're one of those three people. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> to keep shooting, you know what I'm saying? Hey, keep it. Hey, that's what it is. Persistence, man. Consistency. That's a, that's a fact, man. All right, man. So we're wrapping up now, man. Where yeah. can people find you? People can find me at my Instagram, um, io dot So a y o dot d u y i l e. I'm gonna say that again because I know it's very Nigerian, and a lot of people not gonna get it. Uh, Instagram at a y o dot d u y i l e and you know um yeah that's the way to reach me man or um, trying to think what else instagram is the best way to reach me for sure man yeah definitely LinkedIn. connect with me on linkedin um, same same, same name yeah put yeah. that out there and i, I gotta put the full nigerian name out there so it's iodele duyule um a y o d e l e space duyule d u y i l e so connect with me on linkedin i'm definitely um big on there and trying to connect with as many people as possible Yo, when you said that, like, I just remember being at my friend's house and hearing his mom call him. His name is, you know, same name as he's like, ah, yo, Dele. Just yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> it just, it just rings in my He's like, ah, yo, Dele. Just like, come here right now. <laughs> yeah, that's how all Nigerian moms be calling their sons. Ah, yo, Dele. Oh, yeah, yeah. come here right now. So. <laughs> come, come here, come right now. <laughs> uh, so yo, man. Dreams, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ayo, man. Thank you, man. Thank you so appreciate much. You. And yeah. uh, definitely appreciate you, bro. And, you know, let's keep staying connected and yeah, yeah. and uh, helping each other out, bro. Yes, sir. Like, yes, sir. It takes a village, man. You feel me? Yes, sir, man. It's a team effort, man. We want to see everybody win. So, yeah, definitely yeah. keep in connect, uh, connection with me, man. Appreciate y'all for having me on. Y'all doing it big, man. I love to see it, man. I uh, appreciate you, man. that. Yes, so, once again, everybody, that's another episode. You know, hustle over everything dot co. You know, make sure to pick up some merch. You see me rocking the hat. Uh huh. So I like it. The crew Fire. neck. On oh, the crew neck. You know what I'm saying? I like the black and tech t shirt as well, man. Yeah, yeah. what is that? So, this, this is a uh, Facebook merch, merch right here. Facebook merch. It's not mine, but, you know, I just wanted to rap real quick. Uh, that's what's up, bro. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah man. Guys. All right, guys. Thank you once again. And that's the pod. That's All the right. pod, man. Peace out. Right. Peace.